Thanks to the organizers for inviting me, to the people who are in residence for coming to the talk. Um, so this is a little different, and I have to confess I feel a little out of place at this meeting, and you'll see why. Interestingly, Leslie and I have the same overarching framework, but we sort of live quite far out on two orthogonal axes. <laughs> and so you'll see as I start to talk about this, how, how our interests align, but how totally different our approaches are. So I'm interested in how we learn and remember, and I think we all are. Um, but I take a very systems approach, not focusing on a specific site or a molecular mechanism, but rather starting with a behavior, asking what the circuit is, and how the system works and learns. So to make my goal tractable, I, I study a simple movement, and I'll tell you about the movement in a, in, in a minute. Um, I have started with the premise that Howard Fields once said to me, which is that all questions of how start as questions of where, and so I focused more on where, trying to also get to how. Um, I focused on the cerebellum because we know that the cerebellum is necessary for learning in the specific movement I study and other movements. And my goal has been to be specific about where, not just to say cerebellum, but which synapses undergo plasticity that cause behavioral learning. And of course, I also need to know the learning rules. Um, and I chose my words carefully here. I do not need to know the molecular specifics of the mechanisms of plasticity. Chosen carefully, because it doesn't mean I'm not interested in them. It just means, I, for my purposes, I don't need to know them. So let me start by introducing the simple movement I study, which is smooth pursuit eye movements. How many people know what smooth pursuit eye movements are? That's pretty good. Um, so this is a video of me tracking a target that moves back and forth. And you can see I'm moving my eyes smoothly um, and, and tracking the target. You can't tell that I'm tracking the target quite well. And this is evidence that uh, I need this moving visual input to be able to make this movement. So it's a visual motor movement. And now I'm being asked to move my eyes as slowly and smoothly as I can without the target. And you can see I'm not making smooth movements. I'm making a lot of little saccades. So you need the visual stimulus to, t to drive this movement. <clears throat> and um, we study this movement using awake behaving rhesus monkeys because it's they're good at the movement, and it's easier to record from their brains at the level of single neurons than it is in humans. And uh, the preparation is we have a monkey sitting in a plastic box that we call a chair. His head is affixed to the ceiling of the chair. That allows us to get him to move his eyes rather than his head. We train him to fixate and track a spot of light that appears in front of him. We use a magnetic technique to monitor his horizontal and vertical eye position. We give him droplets of juice in exchange for tracking the target. And not shown here, we can make a hole in his skull, implant a recording cylinder, and introduce microelectrodes and drive them down to the region of interest. <laughs> so this is what the monkey does on a you know, typical behavioral task. Target steps to the left, moves to the right, and the monkey's eye, shown as the red dot, tracks it pretty well. If you look carefully when I start this again, you'll see that he starts to move his eye just before the target reaches it. He overshoots at the end and makes the saccade back. That's really nice tracking. Um, we study it more like this in oscilloscope traces. So now time is running this way. Eye and target position are here. Target steps to the left, ramps to the right. You can see that he has a latency. Then he starts to generate a smooth eye movement that precedes the time when the target catches the eye, and he tracks it gorgeously. Take the first derivative. This is a target velocity of 20 degrees per second. Latency, rapid acceleration, accurate tracking. Um, now, I, a lot of my research could go off in a direction and talk to you about how the animal generates this movement, but for today, it's about learning. Um, we have the advantage of knowing the, the anatomy of this system, visual sim signals come from the retina, through the geniculate, to the primary visual cortex, to area MT that most but not all of you have heard of probably, which is an area of the extrastriate visual cortex that's specialized for processing motion. From MT through cortical cortical pathways, from multiple cortical areas down to the pons, at least two areas of the cerebellum one of which is called the flocular complex, which projects disynaptically, 
Purkinje cells project to uh, neurons in the vestibular nucleus that themselves project to the motor neurons. And so we're, this, this is the key area. I've actually been studying, been recording from this area since 1972 on and off. Uh, when I finished my thesis, I actually thought we were done, that we totally understood it. Uh, I was, of course, there have been multiple PhD theses from my lab and others on it since. Um, but this is the area that turns out to be really important for learning oculomotor tasks, both the vestibular ocular reflex and pursuit high movements. Okay, so a strategy to provoke learning in pursuit. So again, we have up here the animal is, this is what the animal sees. He's going to be asked to track a target. The target will start by moving to the right, and after 250 milliseconds, it changes direction and moves upward. I'll show that again. This tells the animal that when the target moves to the right, that means in 250 milliseconds, you've got to move your eyes up. And so um, if we, we look at a learning session now where we present the same target repeatedly, and now you're going to see the same kind of eye movement and target movement up here, and you're going to see me start to accumulate the derivative of eye position, namely eye velocity, in the learning direction, which is the direction he has to learn to make an eye movement, down here. And here on the first trial, he's reactive. On the second trial, you can already see generated some learning. Fifth trial, a little more learning. Tenth trial, more learning. Fiftieth. And by the hundredth trial, we've shown him an instruction of 30 degrees per second, and he's generating about 18 degrees per second of vertical eye velocity. Now, we pay him for being on the target at the end. And we don't punish him for the fact that he has latencies. Uh, and so he's got to be on the target at the beginning. Uh, we don't, we, we let him just do what he does through here, and we pay him for getting back on the target at the end. Uh, and the, to do that, he has to try pretty hard. Uh, we could probably make him try harder, but at some cost. Uh, I think we all know that the harder we're pressed, probably the more anxious we get and the less we do. So we have to kind of balance that. So this is complicated because there's a visual stimulus here, and the, there's going to be a reaction to that stimulus. Out here, the eye velocity is going way off trace because he's making psychotic eye movements that are, have, tar have velocities to 300 degrees per second. So what we really want to look at is the part of this movement that occurs before there's any chance for the change in target velocity to affect eye movement. And so we simply close it all off and we say this is learning in this particular eye movement. And we measure the eye velocity at the time when the uh, instruction occurred. And when we do that, we get learning curves that look like this. So this plots eye velocity as a function of the number of trials. For an experiment, we were actually able to get the animal to run out to 2,000 trials, which those of few of you who work with monkeys know that's a lot of trials for a monkey. Dean? Explaining the onset and the offset, are those both correlated? It is not. The, the offset, um, the animal is not learning the offset. The animals always anticipate offsets. So we're focusing entirely on the onset of the, the instruct, of the, 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 in, in response to the change in target direction that occurs 250 milliseconds after the target moves. But it's not learning the duration of? No, no, no. no. Uh, so the learning curve has a rapid increase and then a steady increase. And if you try to, I mean, this is kind of trivial. I feel, I'm embarrassed even to have to say this. If you try to fit it with a single exponential, it doesn't work. If you hit it with two exponentials, you get a good fit. Uh, that tells us that there likely are multiple components of learning, and they have different time courses. And going back to the, take a page from the book of Hodgkin and Huxley, multiple time courses probably means multiple mechanisms. And just to give you a little look ahead, we're going to be talking in terms of multiple components of learning that occur at different sites and use different mechanisms of plasticity over different time courses. And so this is where you get me, I get some overlap with Leslie. And so one can think of this as short-term learning and consolidation. I'm not sure whether we run these experiments long enough to actually get to what she would call long-term learning. Um, but I'm going to say it's not a molecular property, it's a systems property. Okay.
We know a little bit about the anatomy. I you put anatomy in quotes. Yep. Uh, uh, yeah, so trial takes about three seconds, so it's about 20 trials a minute. So 200 trials takes 10 minutes, 2,000 trials takes 100 minutes, it's a couple hours, okay? Then you come back the next day. You come back the next day, and the next day there's always, there's some residual learning, and so we always use different directions, right? We start with washout trials and then we use different directions. A bit like long term, exactly. Um, it for us, like saccades, it's in the way, right? <laughs> but so it goes. So we know the microcircuit in the cerebellum. This is the canonical circuit because it's gotten more complicated recently. Uh, personally, I think the complications are noise, but that's just my style. Um, so this is circa 1970. Purkinje cells are the sole output neurons. They send inhibitory outputs to the cerebellar nuclei. They receive two inputs, one of which comes over an anatomically unusual climbing fiber from the inferior olive. One climbing fiber climbs all over the proximal dendrites of Purkinje cells. Each Purkinje cell gets inputs from five to 10 climbing fibers. So this is sort of a, you know, from the perspective of the Purkinje cell, it's a one-to-one -one synapse. The mossy fiber parallel fiber system is completely different. Many mossy fibers come in, they terminate on granule cells that project up to the uh, molecular layer and bifurcate into parallel fibers. Each Purkinje cell sees, we can argue about the number, half a million or a million potentially parallel fibers of which it's thought that many, maybe even most are silent. So let's say it's got an option on 10, 100,000 or 10,000 inputs. And then there's some inhibitory circuitry that, that conditions the input. And what we know about this system in terms of learning, or what tell, told us to think about the system in terms of learning, is that if you record from a Purkinje cell, you get something that looks like this. And uh, this is a beautifully isolated recording. Um, this is, you don't get this with multi-contact probes, by the way. Um, these are what are called simple spikes, and they originate from the parallel, from the mossy fiber parallel fiber system. And this is what we call a complex spike. It represents single spike or burst of spikes coming in on the axons from a climbing fiber. Uh, the way this <coughs> system works, simple spikes are buzzing along at 50 to 100 spikes per second. Complex spikes, as Jennifer said, are one per second. Uh, if you put a multi-contact probe in, you don't get this kind of isolation, because the multi-contact probes don't have the two mega ohm impedance that a single electrode has, which is what was used here. With, I mean, the separate path for this talk that I decided to not follow is that you can record from the cerebellum with multi-contact probes and you get, a, you, you get a good collection of cells and you can isolate them and you can record multiple Purkinje cells at the same time and do a pretty good job of separating them. We can talk about that. So this I sort of think of as the anatomy of cerebellar learning, but this, this is what look, the cerebellum looks like, what this part of the cerebellum looks like after 100 trials of learning. So if you give 100 repeated instructions, and then you look at the change in eye velocity, in the on direction of the Purkinje cell, you get an increase. In the off direction, you get a decrease in eye velocity. This is the behavioral learning. If you look at what the climbing fibers did during those 100 trials, what you find is that for the off direction of learning, they consistently, with the probability of 0.5, emitted a complex spike about 100 milliseconds after the instruction, and for the opposite direction, they were more or less suppressed. And if you look at the change, the learn change in simple spike firing, in the on direction, it beautifully models the uh, eye velocity, and in the off direction, it also models the eye velocity. And in both cases, it precedes it by 10 milliseconds, which is about what you expect for this system. So this is where, the, you know, this is, what makes us think that this is a part of the brain that's involved in learning. And so now we can ask, what's going on? Well, um, I long since learned that at summer meetings, you better present your conclusions fairly early in the talk. So we're halfway through, and here is my conclusion slide, and I can stop afterwards if you want. So 
This is what we think of as the principles of operation in this learning circuit. And I need to give credit to Mar, Albus, and Ito, who suggested the original idea that climbing fibers teach parallel fiber to Purkinje cell synapses learn, and that's where motor learning is. So the way we think of this now, based on what I will tell you in a little bit, is that there's an early site of learning, fast early learning, that occurs at the parallel fiber to Purkinje cell synapse. It is instructed by the climbing fiber inputs that are driven by the instruction. Then, as the Purkinje cells learn, they develop a response, and that response becomes a teaching signal that operates down here at the level of the cerebellar nucleus and instructs slow learning that's remembered longer in the cerebellar nuclei. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> you'll see when I get to the end that in the model, to make this actually work and reproduce data, <coughs> we have to assume that the relationship of the parallel fibers and these input fibers to I velocity is quite different. And then finally, there is an anatomical feedback to the inferior olive, and we have, a we have evidence that what that does is to prevent, af after this system has learned, it prevents the olive from signaling errors very well anymore. And I won't have time to go into that today. So, as I said, I could stop here. But I'm not going because I know that at least someone in the, uh, this audience would say, how do you know that? And so I'm going to tell you how we know one and two. So fast, early learning, and easy forgetting in cerebellar cortex instructed by climbing fibers. <clears throat> this is an experiment that Yin Yang did, inspired by a discovery that Javier Medina made of fast learning instructed by climbing fibers. And this experiment, in this experiment, the the pa learning paradigm is different. We're not presenting the same stimulus over and over and inducing intermediate term or long term learning, we are presenting learning stimuli that are in random directions. So the target always starts to the right, and then on some, in, some trials, the instruction is upward, on some trials, the instruction is downward, and these are randomly interleaved. And what that does is it puts the system in a state of continuous short term learning and avoids long term learning, and it gives us the advantage that we can record 400 trials. And if you can record 400 trials, you can actually extract signal from noise. So it's, it's, it's just a technical advance, but it's, it's the way we were able to study this fast early learning. And here's what we discovered. What we did is to take pairs of trials. So he, in this case, we have two trials where the, the learn, the instruction was the same, target to the right, then instruction up, target to the right, then instruction up. We'll call this the instruction trial, and this the test trial. If, and this is the spike train of the Purkinje cell, if there was a complex spike, if the climbing fiber input occurred on the instruction trial, then we observed a pause that I've a bit exaggerated here in the firing of the same Purkinje cell, simple spikes, on the next trial. And if no complex spike occurred, then we observed a slight enhancement. Okay, let me show you the data. Oh, so what we did is we took our 400 trials, we separated them into pairs, we looked for all the trials where the tar instruct where the, where the two where there were two consecutive identical stimuli, um, and we asked we we divided them according to whether or not there was a climbing fiber response on the first trial, and we averaged them together in separate box groups to see whether there was a, a, a change in simple spikes uh, between trials. And so here's what we found. This graph plots the learn change in simple spike firing, that's simple spike firing on the test minus the instruction, as a function of time from the instruction. So this is where the target changed direction. And if there was a complex spike on the instruction trial in red, then we saw a well-timed, on average, six spike per second depression of simple spike firing on the next trial. And if there was no complex spike, we saw, we always saw a slight potentiation. It's never statistically significant, but it's always there. At what point does one say it's simply because we don't have enough trials? Um, and then interestingly, if we look at the learned I velocity in relation to the same set of trials, what we find is that the learning is much larger if there was a complex spike than if there wasn't. Now, here, we've averaged the responses 
of multiple Purkinje cells. Here, what we're doing is averaging all the Purkinje cells that are occurring at the same time. And what this means is that all the Purkinje cells are learning or none of them are learning, which suggests to us that there's a lot of synchrony in the climbing fiber input for which there's considerable evidence in the literature. So this, yeah, this is the evidence. It tells us that there is fast learning in the cerebellar cortex instructed by climbing fibers. I've been criticized because this is correlational on the, on the one hand. On the other hand, it's sort of causal in the sense that I've manipulated whether or not the climbing fiber's there, and I've shown that learning depends on it. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, the background firing rates are around 50 to 100 spikes per second, but we've subtracted that off because these are the difference between two trials on which the background was the same. Yeah? Um, same thing. <clears throat> so this, I mean, I, I, we, we, we separated them according to having the instruction in the same direction just to make it conceptually simpler for the audience. Uh, but what happens on this trial in this interval before the instruction has any effect on anything depends only on what happened on the instruction trial. What if you trace out the idea? How far can you trace that? Complicated. Um, you can space it, it, it I mean, it, on the one hand, it looks like if you space it out by six or 10 seconds, that you start to lose this. On the other hand, it turns out that that's not really because the learning's gone away, it's because the animal's motivation, his, how hard he's trying, drifts down a little bit. <clears throat> and so it looks like it gets smaller, but it, it's, it's, it's due to that other effect. Bill? Right. But before you show that the should I, how does this compare with that initial slope? Oh, or is it, is the interleaving? Uh, so the interleaving may be having an effect. We've never actually asked what do we see in the first learning trial when we present 100. So I, I, don't, I, can't, I, I can't tell you the answer. I assume it would be similar to this, that it would be a half a degree per second. But if you look at our time courses, over 100 trials, right, even over 30 trials, 30 trials, we get to, you know, 80% of the learning that we get after 2,000 trials. So this early part of the learning is very fast. And actually, we discovered this effect because Javier came to me and he said, Steve, we have a problem. He said, almost all our learning occurs in 30 trials. In 30 trials, there are only 15 complex spikes. If long-term depression is causing this, that can't be the cause. That, it, that just can't be true because it's too few complex spikes. And I said to him, go back and do this analysis. And he did, and it worked out, right? So these early complex spikes are having a lot of effect. Now, if you go out and look after 100 trials and look at the complex spikes, much lower probability that you're going to get one. So this system seems to be engaged very early, and then it seems to be suppressed by the inhibitory feedback of the inferior hull. Okay. Transfer to a slow learning, long memory site in the deep cerebellar nuclei instructed by Purkinje cells. So you've seen this. This is where we are after 100 instructions. So for on direction and off direction learning, and here's the eye movement, and here's the simple spike firing. That's a static amount of learning that we've gotten after 100 instruction, 100 trials. Here's how we get there. So um, these are averages of changes, learned changes in simple spike firing as a function of sets of 10 trials over the first 100 trials. Um, one thing that strikes me uh, in relation to this bill is that here we have faster learning for the depression than we do for the potentiation. And you can see that we're getting around 
what, seven to 10 spikes per second of learning over the first 10 trials. And so that kind of gives us a feeling of how fast it's going. So then the question is, what happens if we go out? And so what Nate Hall discovered is that if you go out past 100 trials to 600 trials, and this is pressing your luck when you're recording from Purkinje cells 35 millimeters deep in the brain of a monkey, but, um, and so the number of cells isn't huge, but what he found was that learning continues to increase, but the Purkinje cell, the learned response, peaks at around 100 trials, and then it starts to just go away. So this is an awkward situation if we think this is the site of behavioral learning because we're getting more learning, but we're losing the neural correlate. And just to go on with that a little bit, um, here's a little more data from Nate. It's superimposing all the different cells. Um, and you, you can see it's you know, different in every cell. There's a lot of variation, but this is what it add up, adds up to. And in fact, over 600 trials, in this case, most of the learning was lost. This is the kind of result that when I look at it, when, someone, when a postdoc or a student brings this result to me, I look at it and I say, way too good to be true, do it again. And so one of the things that we did was to look, at, look back to Javier's data, and I only showed you what Javier, uh, I only showed you the first 100 trials of Javier's data, but if you look at the next 100 trials, he went out to 200, you can see that we're starting to get the same thing. Learning is going up, for Kinji cell, learning is going down. Um, I have a placeholder here. Uh, I'm waiting for one more data set that's in the can and waiting to be analyzed. If anybody knows how to instill a sense of urgency into postdocs, please let me know. <laughs> this has been an enormous frustration to me. Send them that slide. Yeah. <laughs> okay, finally, a computational model. So David Hertzfeld um, made, made, he actually made this model and here are the equations. And there are learning equations for these weights up here and learning equations for these weights down here. Uh, usually I show, show that this model reproduces the data beautifully first, and then I show the model and say, see, it's really a model. But for this audience, I decided first I'd show you that there's a model, and this model is based entirely on the summary slide that I showed you, and now all we've done is to add the firing properties of these inputs in relation to I velocity. And you can see, as I said, they are completely different. These are linear and these are tuned. Um, I will say we've never seen tuned, I -velocity, tuned, tuned relations to eye velocity in the brain stem. I have no idea if, how that's actually implemented. This is just how we represented it in the model. And this model reproduces a ton of data. So here are learning curves. And they're learning curves for instructions that range from 2 to 30 degrees per second. And you can see that the model, which is shown in the bold lines, fits the data pretty impressively. These are generalization curves. So here is generalization where we test it, where, we, where the animal learned with a, an instruction at five degrees per second, and then we tested it with pursuit probes at different speeds. And you can see that the faster the speed, the, there's lousy generalization early in, in the early trials, great generalization by the time you get out to 2,000 trials, model does the same thing. In this model, we sort of built into it that the Purkinje cells learn early and forget, same thing here, and this is our prediction for what the FTNs ought to do. They ought to continue to increase as learning increases. So that's, that's my story. Oops. Back to the summary slide. Fast, early learning up here, transfer, to a slow learning, long memory, longer memory site, uh, to defer slightly to Leslie here, uh, longer memory site in the cerebellar nucleus, feedback that sort of operates, it's, it's not made of plasticity, but it has the same effect. It's prevent, once you have some learning, it's preventing more plasticity from occurring up here, uh, and two different neural signals are learned in the two different sites. And then just to give credit where credit is due, Javier discovered single trial learning. Megan was an uh, unindicted co-conspirator with a lot of Javier's work. Yin did, a, did the random direction paradigm, single trial learning and plasticity. David Hertzfeld did the behavioral analysis, the multiple time con course idea is his. Um, 
He's also been responsible for our probe recording and cell type classification that I'm not talking about. And Nate is multiple components of behavioral learning, possible transfer to the deep nuclei and the, the guru of cerebellar spike sorting. So thank you. So the reduction in spiking from one trial to the next after 2.5 seconds, mm -hmm. could that, instead of being learning, the complex spike activation basically is setting in motion some enhanced inhibition. And so you're really just getting a suppression of spiking due to some increase in inhibitory drive. So you're asking me at the question of what's the mechanism? Well, is it not learning, but just more inhibition? Um, how is, how is well-timed inhibition, I mean, it's, it's occurring, it's well-timed, right? It's occurring around the time when the instruction occurred. And in this system, if I had given the instruction at 500 milliseconds, that's when the learning would have been expressed. So there's something in there that's sensitive to time that's causing depression. Now, um, I, I, I'm not, I think it's a philosophical argument of what's learning versus what's simply, you know, some intrinsic sort of mechanism that's already there. Uh, I don't think that the system was built to learn, you know, to respond in this particular learning paradigm. I think what we've done is to take a learning mechanism that it has and express it. Now, I want to say that one of the things people frequently ask, which might help you a little bit here, is, is the pursuit system learning or is the animal learning? Is this cognitive? And the evidence I have that this isn't cognitive is that if, if you take a random direction task and instead you have the instruction be up on one trial, down on the next, up and then down, you do it alternating. So the, the cog right cognitive thing to do is to emit and a, a learned eye movement in the direction of the instruction you're going to see. So after a thousand trials, you ought to figure that out. But what the animal does is to emit a learned eye movement in the direction of the preceding instruction. So I think it's the pursuit system responding to what it's told. Now, I don't know what the mechanism is. Um, and I, just to be careful with my words here, I don't need to know to understand how this system learns, but I do care to know because I think it, it's an interesting question. <clears throat> and uh, I guess, um, so if you're getting complex spikes around half the trials, what's special about those trials? Why is it around 50%? What's special about those trials is... Is there any pattern in yeah, terms of it's the It's part, partly that there are fluctuations, trial to trial fluctuations in simple spike firing. When the simple spike firing is higher, you get more complex spikes because of the inhibitory system, the double inhibitory system that goes to the inferior olive. So we think that, that's, that's, that that accounts for a certain amount of that probability. The rest, I mean, complex spikes just don't, they just don't fire on, in, and not just in this system, in any system. They don't fire to every stimulus. So <clears throat> this is a beautiful talk. Thanks very much. Uh, I was intrigued by this idea of having a, a fast and a slow learning system here mm -hmm. and uh, it vaguely reminded me of uh, you know two, this, two the two systems model of hippocampal cortical interactions where the hippocampus is supposed to be a fast learner and the cortex is a yep. slow learner and so in relation to that i was wondering what would it what would be the rationale here for these two systems and whether there are any kind of analogous pieces of evidence that this sort of consolidation happens where in, in, in the hippocampus and in the context of the hippocampus and the cortex, of course, the evidence is that if you lesion the hippocampus at different times during learning, then it has very different effects on, on behavior. And I was wondering whether there is any analogous evidence in the system for that. Yes. Um, what's Haranu. Haranu did the experiment of inducing learning in the optokinetic system using a somewhat different approach. And then he, found that if you lesion the cerebellum immediately, the learning goes away. But if, if you wait six hours, 24 hours, then the learning's still there. Um, the other, so, but, and I would also say that I spent the first half of my career using a very similar approach to study motor learning in the vestibulo-ocular reflex, 
in the same sets of cells. Uh, and the conclusion of that, which was really published in a series of papers in an archival journal called the Journal of Neurophysiology, a few of you may have heard of it. Uh, they don't publish many papers anymore, but in 1994, the conclusion of that was that there are two sites of learning, one in the cerebellar cortex and one in the cerebellar nucleus. Uh, there wasn't this early and late idea because we studied animals who, were total, who, had, who had undergone learning for weeks because of the practicalities. Now, the answer to your other question is why would the system be organized like this? Well, I think that the cerebellar cortex wants to be flexible. It wants to be available to respond to changes in the world. If those changes persist for a long time and consistently, then it, it doesn't want to be bothered with them anymore. It wants to push the learning out, get it in a place where it can live happily so the cerebellar cortex can be restored even to its baseline level and ready to learn again. And so I think of it as the short-term learning in the cerebellar cortex, the intermediate-term learning in the cerebellar nucleus, and then I think the long-term learning is probably a case where if, it, if this is going to be permanent, I don't think it's the system stops with having lear the learning occur in the cerebellar nucleus. There's a complex motor system down there, and it's all got to be rebalanced. So I think it probably pushes the learning through the whole system eventually. And that's where the system's long-term learning is. Hi. Beautiful. Um, I guess it is, this is also a mechanism question, but uh, what do you think is, how can the Purkinje cell provide an instructive signal? Since, I mean, it is inhibitory and then it is being inhibited. So do you think there's something in between that it disinhibits? No, uh, what, I mean, we think of it as probably a, a postsynaptic form of plasticity. And so if the Purkinje cell is decreasing its firing, that allows disinhibition, which increases the membrane potential of the target neuron and then allow, causes learning in the other inputs. And, you know, that's not a mechanism, right? That, you guys don't think of that as a mechanism. That's a rule. That's a learning rule. And so that's how I think about it. Steve, uh, thank you. Great talk. Um, regarding savings and generalization, is there any difference between if you train at 250 and then chain the direct, change the direction, or if you chain, train at 250 and then change the interval, so you go to 500 milliseconds, is there any difference in savings in those two spatial versus temporal directions or impairment? Uh, the answer is that I have no idea, and I'm curious why you want to know that. <laughs> <laughs> Other than your interest in learned timing. Actually, that may actually be partially um, my question. So if you are actually inhibiting the short-term learning when you actually transfer into the, the longer-term phase, does that allow you to more quickly shift to a new task? That's my thinking, yes. But, but you yeah. haven't tested that? We haven't so tested that. The no. difference between no. 100 trials and, and yeah, 500 no, that, trials. Those are interesting experiments. We haven't done those, yeah. So I, I have a quick question about the anatomy, because I, I don't understand. Um, so the, the initial task is to track a moving object in one direction at one speed. So I'm just wondering, as you go from the Purkinje cell to the sub cerebellar nuclei, do you, um, is, is there convergence of information of multiple Purkinje, is there a narrowing of yeah. a smaller structure, and how do you preserve specificity? Yeah, so uh, the answer that's in the literature is that a cerebellar nucleus neuron receives strong inputs from 25 to 40 Purkinje cells. And then it may be receiving, and mostly on the soma, and then it may also be receiving much weaker inputs from more Purkinje cells, but on the uh, distal dendrites. And so I'm not sure where that falls in terms of the amount of convergence. If you look at the Purkinje cells and simply ask how well are the responses of two e similarly tuned Purkinje cells correlated with each, with each other on a trial by trial basis, the answer is quite well. So averaging across 40 cells is gonna beautifully clean up the noise, but it is not gonna change the signal very much. Uh, and we've just finished, we've done this quantitatively. We've been, we have a paper that's in press where we've looked at Purkinje cell synchrony on a millisecond time scale. And one of the questions was, do you need Purkinje cell synchrony at all to account for how the 
cerebellar nucleus neurons uh, respond? And the answer is you don't. And the, the reasoning on that is you can just make a linear weighting of 40 Purkinje cells and you account for 98% of the variance of the firing of the downstream neurons. I think this is a related question. How hard is it to find these neurons, these Purkinje cell neurons in the flocculus? Is it like 10% of them are doing this or 100% of them are doing this? And, and related to that is you mentioned that you know, your animals are naive, so you kind of train them in one direction, one pursuit one day, and then the next day you kind of move the stimulus to another, I guess, receptive field location, yep. and they're, they're like babies. They, they've never done it before, and, and everything is back to baseline. Is that... Okay, so how... So the answer to your second question is they're not like babies. Okay. But, so... Okay. <laughs> but, but I, I guess, how distributed are these changes? Yeah. Are they, yeah. like, so that's a topic? Really good question. Or they, yeah. And the answer to that question, when we went in with single electrodes and trolled until we found a cell we really liked, that responded really well, and then recorded from it as long as we could? The answer was, they're all like that. But now that we've been in with multi-contact probes, where you do the experiment differently, you find the area where it looks like it responds to eye movements, and you wait an hour for everything to stabilize, you record what you get on 16 or 32 contacts, and then you go back and analyze it afterwards. Um, there's much more cell-to-cell -cell diversity than I had appreciated. But the general rules still hold. They fall into multiple, they fall into multiple categories in terms of their preferred direction. They pretty much all respond during the initiation and maintenance of pursuit. They pretty much all learn in this kind of task. The main variation is the slight variances in direction, in, in, in their, their responses to off direction. Uh, we find with the probes, we find a lot more neurons that are more weakly modulated. Those are the ones that we found with the single electrodes. We said, no, not good enough, right? So um, <clears throat> I find it to be an interesting philosophical question when now that we're recording with 16 or 32 or 500 or 5,000 contacts, um, are all the neurons important or just the ones that are responding pretty well? Now, I don't know the answer. Um, this might be related to the question that was asked before, but, um, you know, because of such different anatomy in the uh, cerebellum and the nucleus, um, you don't have, well, the nucleus doesn't have as many neurons as there are granule cells in the cerebellum. Yeah, nowhere near. So it isn't just the time scale of learning that is different there. It also has a different number of degrees of freedom. So how can it um, still maintain the sort of the diversity of the learning that happens in the right. cerebellum? So this is an eye, not an arm. <clears throat> and evolutionarily, the ocular motor system <clears throat> chose its principal components based on its oldest input, which is the vestibular system. And so the brainstem ocular motor system operates in three dimensions. Okay, it operates in sort of horizontal, vertical, and torsional. And so we think that even though there aren't that many neurons down here, I mean, there aren't, you know, 10 to the 10th, what, 10 to the 10th granule cells in the cerebellum. Um, I estimate there are probably a thousand Purkinje cells that are relevant for this behavior in the flocculus of the monkey. Um, there are probably the same number of, of flocular FTNs, flocular target neurons. Uh, but that we think that because it's focused on those different axes, that it's not a not a computational problem that there aren't that you know how many dimensions of input are available. We think they're pretty much already aligned in in those those three dimensions. I, I guess another way to ask my question is, wouldn't you be able shouldn't you be able to see the signature of the difference in dimensionality of slow and fast learning in your data? If we had actually recorded the neural substrate of slow learning, yes. We okay. haven't done that yet. Okay. Uh, we're debating. If that, that is an experiment that is, uh, I'll simply call it daunting. Okay. okay. <laughs> so that, I mean, the output dimensions are maybe low, but the, the context, the, the capacity for context dependent on might be quite high. And the field hasn't probed it that much. And when we have, these, like, steep high speed, we found that you can learn to make an eye, you know, different eye movements depending on a number of things. Mm -hmm. 
maybe we are losing dimensionality, like functional dimensionality in terms of context. In terms of context, but not in terms of, not in terms of viable context. signals. Yeah, yeah. Dependence. Yeah. Um, hi, here, down here. Uh, thanks for that very clear talk and, and also for mentioning David Marr. I'm a, a fan like the, any next person. I am, however, very much interested in the noise. Um, and I just wanted to ask your opinion on the fact that granule cells constitute 80% of the entire neuron population in the central nervous system. And in your model, which is very clear and, 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 and very, very appealing, they don't seem to be acting as anything else as a relay of the mossy fiber signal. So do you think that there is no learning and no plasticity at all? And if that's so, isn't that a huge metabolic waste? Um, so the simple answer is no, I don't think that there's not other places of learning. And yes, it would be a huge metabolic waste. The longer answer is that if they'd given me an hour, I would have gotten on to some of those issues. So what we're doing now is we are using these multi-contact probes. We've developed a pipeline that allows us to do um, what we call cell, cell type resolution from extra properties of extracellular recording from knowing the layer of the recording, which we can do quantitatively, the waveform, which if you're careful with your filtering and that sort of thing, you can do really quantitatively, and the resting discharge properties. And then the question, and this is a, a the, there's, there's a mountain of data waiting to be analyzed. So we've recorded with probes during a lot of different tasks, a lot of learning, a lot of baseline pursuit. The question that remains to be answered is whether we find correlates of learning in these other cell types. We can identify mossy fibers, Golgi cells, Purkinje cells, basket cells, unipolar brush cells, and other molecular layer interneurons that aren't, that don't, don't act like basket cells. The only cells we can't record from are the granule cells. So, but from our analysis and our thinking on this, we think it's very unlikely that the granule cells are simply relays. We are actually, we actually think they are the site of a complicated spatial and temporal integration that probably is, now, I, you know, I always say to Jennifer, I, I don't care about the molecular mechanisms, but it probably is the result of synaptic dynamics, because that's the only explanation we can come up with based on what we know. So I think that the granule cells still are, I mean, Marr was, he, he was right that they are a really important place for information processing in the cerebellum. Uh, his exact idea might be, you know, misguided or even wrong, but that's okay, right? I'm hoping to stop there, so thanks very much. Okay.